Randy sent me a text, said there were a couple of other announcements that I forgot. Number one is, remember to fall back next Saturday night, I believe is correct. Uh, the second one is, after you get uh, ready to leave this morning, please take your own communion cups and throw those away. Uh, is there still a trash can in the back, Randy? So there's a trash can there. Make sure you drop those off on your way out. If you leave by this door, drop them off. Do that yourself so that somebody else doesn't have to pick up your cup with your germs on it, okay? So appreciate your help in that. You know, one of the cool things about these uh, music videos that we bought is when you buy the album, they come with the full version, which is what we just heard, and then they come with a training track, which is just one voice of all four parts, uh, so that you can sit down and listen to it, and the sopranos can listen and hear their part, the altos can hear theirs, the uh, tenors and the basses can hear and learn their own part. And actually, several years ago, I bought some of these albums. I didn't buy the full package that had the video with it, it was just the album, because I like listening to this kind of music keeps my mind focused and everything. So I downloaded the album, not realizing that the training track was included with it. And so I'm driving down the road one day and I'm listening to, to one of the albums and I had it set up on my Jeep so that I'm, it's on the random mode so that you're not just listening to the songs in order but it takes all the songs throughout the album and kind of mixes them up. And so as I'm driving along listening, this one song came on and it didn't sound quite right. In fact, I'm going to have Brandy play a little bit of it for you here. Ooh, couldn't keep it to myself. Couldn't keep it to myself. Couldn't keep it to myself. Ooh, couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, for me. song, isn't it? Catchy little tune. But I'm sitting there driving along and I'm thinking, something's not right. And, it, and so when I finally got home, I pulled out I pulled out my phone and I'm looking through it and I'm like, oh, they've got all of the regular tracks, the full version, and then down at the bottom they're all repeated as the training track. And that's what I've been listening to, one of those training tracks. And even though it was kind of cool and kind of catchy, it didn't have everything. Here's what the full version sounds like. Sound like I was going to tell anybody, but I could keep it to myself. Could keep it to myself. Could keep it to myself. Said I was going to tell anybody, but I could keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, for me. You all have been there. Brandy, crank it up, you know, because, I mean, with all the parts, it's full, and it's rich, and you get everything that's in the song there. Well, on the training track, even though it's important, because we need to be able sometimes to hear my part, and know how my part's supposed to be, but then, man, when you put it all together, it's something completely different and better, right? Well, as we've been studying through the book of James, I have pointed out a couple of times that whenever we break the book up and we start pulling sections out of it and doing lessons on sections out of it, that's kind of like a training track. You know, there's stuff in there we need to know, but until you put it all together and get all the parts together, that's when you get the richness and the fullness and you begin to understand that when James is talking about a topic, he doesn't just block off one little section and talk about that topic. He actually weaves it through the entire letter. And so this morning, as we finish up the book of James, what we're going to be doing is kind of a recap. We're going to do the full version of James. I'm going to read the entire thing uh, here in just a moment. But before we do that... I want us to kind of go back over some of the points from the training track that we've been doing. I'm not going to go back and rehash every single sermon. We're not going to be here for six hours this morning. 
But I did this week, I went back and I looked at some of the key themes, key lessons, key uh, points of interest that James weaves throughout this book. And there are ten of those. And if you've got a piece of paper and a pencil, I'd encourage you to write these down. And, and maybe as you go back and study through James, maybe you'll just kind of pay a little more attention to this. But I'm going to give you these ten topics, themes, foundational teachings, whatever you want to call them, that I found as I go back through the full version of James. And I, these aren't in any order necessarily because even though there are some topics in here that, that I would say this is what he means most, this is what he's hitting on the most, then all of a sudden I come up with another one and see how often he brings it up and it's like, well, this must be the one that he's talking about the most and it all just kind of weaves together. But here are the ten in the order that I wrote them down. Number one is perseverance. Perseverance. James indicates to his readers, you started down a good path. Now stay the course. Don't be led astray. Don't get blown off course by all the other stuff that's out there. Perseverance. The second one is belief. And, and by belief, I believe James is talking about trusting God without doubt. You know, there's a, uh, there's a difference between believing in God, believing that there is a God, and believing on God and trusting in Him. And I think when James talks about belief, he's talking about trusting God without doubting this thing we will see comes up over and over again. Number three is being single-minded. James only once talks about double-minded men, but throughout the book, he's reminding his people to be single-minded. You have one calling, you have one purpose, you have one life, one God, and you need to be single-minded. There's all kinds of other stuff out there, other options, other thoughts, you need to be single-minded. Number four, James discusses the temporary nature of wealth and human life. Temporary nature of wealth and human life. He says we are but a mist and our wealth will rot. And that is contrasted with number five, which is the constancy of God. The constancy of God. I actually had those two all as one big one, but I thought that's too much to write and at one time, so I divided it out into the temporary nature of wealth and human life, and then number five is the constancy of God. Number six is earthly, unspiritual desires that are of the devil. You, you may remember we did a specific lesson about this, but as you read the entire epistle, I want you to notice how many times this is hinted at, that there are things of the devil that are earthly and unspiritual that we can fall victim to. Number seven is godly self-control. James is reminding us that while God is ultimately in control of everything, you and I have a responsibility to control our lives in a way that aligns us with God. Keeping a tight rein on our tongue. Doing the things that we need to be doing. Number eight. This one comes up over and over again, and that is this perfect law that gives freedom. Perfect law that gives freedom, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And even though James only a, on a few occasions specifically says that, as you read through the entire epistle, you'll notice that he's telling you to do this, and we know that it's based on love your neighbor as yourself. Number nine is putting your faith into practice. Putting your faith into practice. James talks about deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And these deeds take on multiple forms throughout James, but, James, but one that comes up over and over again is this taming of our tongue. We don't often think about that as a deed, but it is something that we have to work on. 
something we have to do ourselves, putting your faith into practice. And then number 10 is submitting to God. And, and, and as I was making the list, I debated, do I, does submitting to God need to be separate from number one, which was belief in God? And, and I, the more I thought about it and wrestled with it and read through the text, I realized, yeah, that's got to be a separate thing on its own because there are a lot of people who believe in God, but they don't submit their lives to Him. They don't humble themselves and submit themselves before God. Yes, they know God is out there. Yes, they know He exists. Yes, they know He's in control of everything, but I'm still in charge of my own life, and God just agrees with me. And so we need to learn to submit to God. And so with those ten things in mind, I want you to listen, or if you've got your Bibles, read along with me as we read the full version of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who does not, who, or excuse me, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. Because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away, even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and then after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, mm, you stand over there, or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. 
Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such deep faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith if by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Excuse me. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous? For what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set up on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. wise and understanding among you. Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. 
But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill, you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason uh, that God jealously longs for the spirit that he made to live in us. But he gives us more mercy. And that is why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Wait, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you fail to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived in, on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no or you will be condemned. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. And if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. 
Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You know, I have many notes written in my Bible from over the years. And at the top of the book of James, I have this written, the most practical book in the New Testament. Now that may have been something an instructor said once, or might have been something a preacher said once in a sermon. Might have been something I discovered on my own. I really can't remember. But in our circumstances today, living in a kind of exile, with all of the influences around us that can lead us astray, I think James really is a most practical book for us today. I know as I've been studying through it and putting letter, lessons together, I've learned a lot about myself. Learned a lot about things that I really need to be changing. Things I need to be watching out for. Things I need to be avoiding. Things I need to be doing differently to truly become more of a man of God's word. I pray that as we've been going through you have seen some things about you and understood that there are some things that you need to change as well. And I want to ask, before we close this morning with a prayer, I want to ask you to do something, and this is really kind of dangerous for me. What I want to ask is that during this next week, you let me know something that you learned out of the book of James. You can email me. You can text me. You can write a letter and send it to me. But I really would like to hear from all of you something you've learned about yourself or that you've learned that God wants from you that you need to work on. I want to hear from you. And I say this is dangerous for me because if it's dead silence for the next week, that's going to tell me that I accomplished absolutely nothing. Which will really hurt my feelings. But if you do tell me something you've learned, I'll learn something too. First of all, I'll learn how I can better pray for you. And that's something that I've realized in these last month or so that I really need to be doing more and getting better at. Because one of the things that happens for me sometimes is when I've got a lot of other things going on, and most of you know that my life has gotten kind of busy with other things here lately, that I find myself not having time to pray for people and follow up with people as I should. And so that's become one of the things I need to change. I need to love my neighbor as myself. Maybe there's something you've learned. And if I read what you've learned, it'll, it'll strike me and, and help me realize also that, yeah, I need to work on that a little more too. But again, it'll help me to pray for you and maybe teach me something. So I look forward to hearing what you've learned about you, about what God wants from you, about what you need to change from the book of James. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this word. There is just so much packed into that epistle that is very practical for our life today. Father, we live in a world that is, we're bombarded with media that does not support you and encourage people to live a godly life. We're surrounded by debates on who should be leading this country today. And there's not anyone, Father, that's truly faithful to you. And so we're stuck with some tough decisions. Father, are we live in a world today that doesn't value life, doesn't value justice, and yet we are called to cherish life and to stand up for justice. Father, we're just torn today. And we can't be together with each other on a, a regular basis like we used to to keep each other focused where we need to be and so it's so easy to drift. 
pray, Father, that through this study of James, that you've helped us see some things that we need to do to persevere. Father, be with us and let these lessons sink in deeply. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.